How many know that prayer is something that we should all be doing? How, how many know that um, it doesn't have to be your gifting? That if we look at Ephesians, where it talks about giftings, Ephesians 4, we could look at 1 Corinthians 12, we could look at Romans 12. And if I think if we examine all of those areas that it says giftings, you know, like apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, or, or workers of miracles, or, or, or those that have administrations, you wouldn't find intercessory prayer in any one of those. You know why? Because it's something all of us are called to do. Amen? I've got a, a couple of scriptures. I'll begin with Second Chronicles 7.14. It's not my, my um, main text today. The main text will be coming from Nehemiah. But in this text, in Second Chronicles 7.14, uh, this was something that the Lord spoke to Solomon in that great day when the um, Temple of Solomon had just been dedicated. And he said in this scripture, if my people who are called by my name. Uh, that would be every one of us that says that we're a Christian this morning. Amen? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Okay, so far we have nothing here about other people. The people that are not Christians, right? It says here, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Father, we come before you today. I ask you, Lord, that we would have your mind and heart. Lord, to understand what this word is saying to our heart, to our time, for our generation for our lives, Lord. We praise you and thank you that you're the one that leads us and guides us and, and, and uh, you, you have a great work for us to do. We just want to bless you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been talking about uh, first, there's a work for every one of us to do. And, and you know, Jesus had said that my father's been working on to now. Um, and, and the idea that he entered into his father's work, and we also have a work that we must enter into. And last week, we looked at the idea that Peter, being in prison, was released from that prison to a, a greater sphere of, of ministry, but we also took note that the church, what the church had been doing, the church had been praying. They had gathered together in prayer. Even if their prayer wasn't one of fully believing, uh, they at least exercise prayer. How many times have you been in a prayer meeting and you recognize that, that sometimes our prayers are not fully believing? Uh, we, we, we've got to come to a place of encouraging you one another in the prayer because why I say this is that Peter is released from prison through some miraculous thing that an angel does. He comes knocking on the door of the church and, and, and the, the servant girl comes and answers the door of the church and, and she's so excited that Peter's standing out there so she goes into the prayer meeting and says to everybody that's praying, Peter's standing outside. And, and they say, you're crazy. Oh, he can't be him. Maybe it's his, maybe it's his angel. May, maybe his head's been cut off already, and, and you've seen a spirit. Yo, you ever think of those words? You ever think about what they're saying? Because, you know, had they been praying for Peter's release and Peter standing at the door, I think they'd have been rejoicing that their prayer was answered. But, but I wonder what they were praying. Were they praying prayers like this? Oh, God, James' head got cut off, and Peter's there. And, 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 and we, we know, Lord, that uh, he's chained up to, to people. And we're, we're just praying, God, give him the strength. Give him the ability to endure this trial in his life. And, and, and you know, they were praying things like, you know, let, let, let him die good. <laughs> do, do, do you get that impact yet? The fact that, you know, we, we have prayers to pray, and, and, and I think our, our prayers need to have a greater expectation. You know, you, you, you live with a situation for so long, and you begin to pray over that situation, but all you're doing is praying to endure through the situation, not praying God to change the situation. There's a level of expectancy that we need to come with. Here, 
this scripture is saying that there's something about that happens when God's people come together and pray. In Ezekiel 22 verse 30, the Lord was speaking over his people and he said, I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. In fact, in Ezekiel 13, verse 5, he says, You have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in battle on the day of the Lord. Here, God was seeking for an intercessor. He was seeking for someone that was willing. He looked among the people. He looked among the priests. He looked among the prophets. He looked among the princess. And what he's saying is that when, I, when I'm looking around, I'm, I'm looking among the prophets, those that are supposed to declare God's work, and, and they're using God's word in a way, uh, first of all, they're lying to the people. And, and they're not using the word of God in a way to be helpful, but they're using it to profit for themselves. Look at the priests. They're not living a life that's supposed to be lived, and therefore they're not leading the people in the right way. The people, you can't find anyone among them that cares anything about what somebody else is doing because they're all seeking their own. And those that had political realm, he's just saying they're using it for their own power and for their own glory. If you read that chapter, you'll see that. There was an indictment on that generation. You couldn't find it in the prophetic. You couldn't find it in the priest. You couldn't find someone among the people. And you couldn't find them among the princes or, or those that were in political government. And the word of God is saying here, I sought for a man among them who would make a wall, who would stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. And, and I should not destroy it, but I found no one. God, God is seeking for people that will build a wall. Uh, another word for wall is a hedge. It's a, it's a protection for safety. Where the wall was meant to keep enemies out. That includes the death, the destruction, the decay that's happening in our own communities. In John 10.10 it says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And there are walls all around us that are broken down. We have to open up our eyes to be able to see, to be able to understand that God wants his people to be wall builders. He wants his people to stand in the gap, to stand in the gap for families, to stand in the gap for their city, to stand in the gap for the communities that they belong to. It says in Psalm 2.8 that the, the God was speaking to his own son, says, Ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Look, look, God had promised Jesus that he would have all authority, that he would have all power, that the entire world belonged to him. That's what he was to pray. And, and the Lord teaches us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, where? On earth, as it is in heaven. You know, there is something about the kingdom of God that God wants to see replicated in our city, in our family, in our church. Amen? And there needs to be something about understanding that God is calling people to stand in the gap on behalf of others. The book of Joshua, you read the whole book, it's really a land-taking book. Because he says to Joshua, wherever you put your feet, I will give you. But he also says, meditate in this word night and day. Don't turn to the left, don't turn to the right. In other words, stay straight with me, and I'm going to enable you to have victory over time in this area. Amen? Amen? Now look, when we look at broken walls, we have to understand something. When walls are broken down, it allows for satanic attack. It speaks about in the scripture, when the walls are broken, or when someone breaks through a wall, they'll be bitten by a serpent. In Ecclesiastes 10.8. We also know that, that God's vineyard is trampled and burnt. When you do not build a wall around, you not have a place of protection. It says in Isaiah 5.5, 5, Please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burnt. And break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. In other words, when there's not a wall, there is no power. Where there's not a wall, there is no influence. We spoke last week about a study from Bonner and how it showed how few Bible-minded people live in our community, which also says that that means that there's very little influence that we can have as a result of that. 
But as Mark was praying this morning in our prayer time, he said, well, just think about that. If only 9% are Bible-minded, that means that 9 out of 10 people that you meet, you could begin to declare the things of God. Amen? There is a great possibility. Yes. I mean, if I've got to look and can only find 1 in 10 that's not a Christian so I can find them out to spree, we don't have that problem around us. Amen? Practically everyone doesn't know the Lord. And so everyone you meet, you can begin to do a work. But the idea is when, when the wall is broken, there's a satanic harassment, there, there's a trampling that's going down, there's also fruit that's being ruined. In Psalm 80, 12 says this, Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by pluck her fruit? <clears throat> Let me share with you just a moment here. When you read the book of Daniel, Daniel's a great book because it shows a man that stood in the gap in a foreign land. But when you read the first chapter of Daniel, you get an understanding of what the satanic plot was upon the people of God. Because early on, you read in that first chapter, those that the enemy had targeted to be brought into the kingdom of Babylon. Daniel, other good, outstanding young men, were targeted. And the enemy's plot was get the best and the brightest and make them think Babylonian. You take the best and the brightest and you remove them from their family. You transplant them. You remove them from your family, you can remove them from their family's values. If you remove them from the family's values, then you can begin to indoctrinate them in a Babylonian way, in a Babylonian culture, in Babylonian thinking. And, and then if you give them the riches of the king's table, the compromise of the riches will bring them in. In fact, let's give them new names. Let, let's not let them have their Hebrew name. Let's give them a Babylonian name so they no longer remember where they come from. To me, this speaks of the generation that we're ministering in today. You know, that there's, there, there's an enemy attack that wants to take the best and the brightest and remove them from your home, wants to remove them from your values, wants to indoctrinate them in a Babylonian way. Why? So that when they grow up, they think like a Babylonian thinks. There, there are seeds of Satan throughout the city. It says in Psalm 89, 40, You have broken down all his hedges. You have brought his strongholds to ruin. You know, geographical locations can become oppressed. They can be controlled. They can be in bondage. They can be in evil. Our, our cities, our schools, we can see the harassment that's taken place. We can see the indoctrination that's taken place. All of these things are taking place. Why? Because there wasn't one to stand in the gap. There wasn't someone to build up a wall. The Lord says, I look from among them, and there was not one. In fact, we come to understand in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ became the man who would stand in the gap. Because his arm was not too short. And his salvation was something that reached out. And therefore, even what we're going to be celebrating with Easter season coming upon us here, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but, but first was the cross. Verse was the walk to the cross. Amen? Why? Because someone cared enough. Someone that came that was willing to stand in the gap. We, we fail to, to see all that Christ did for us, that even the scripture tells us now that he is interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. Amen? And that's why that when we become a Christian, we can be bold and come before him because of the work he's already done for us. But here's the thing. We, as people of God, need to care. We can't be indifferent. And perhaps the worst sin toward our fellow creatures is not that we hate them. It's that we're indifferent to them. That, that to me, is an essence of inhumanity. You read the story of the Good Samaritan, for instance. You know, here's a man that had been beaten up, had been left for dead, and you see the priest go down the road. And he considers, what will it take if I get involved, and I don't want to get involved because it's going to defile me, so he keeps on going on the other side of the road. A Levite goes by, does the same thing. Of course, Jesus is telling this story to Jews, and probably the person that they like the least is the Samaritan. 
But here a Samaritan stops and he gives of himself to a Jew and begins to nurse his wounds and cares for him, puts him up in a hotel and, and, and even gives money so that he will be cared for. And he says, I'm going to go away, but when I come back, if there's anything owed by this man's care, I'll take care of it. You know, this story that Jesus said really rebukes everyone that folds their arms to indifference. You know, we say somehow, maybe sarcastically people say this sometimes, ask me if I care. You ever heard him say that? You know, the, the idea is that we have to care. We, we are called as the people of God. And, and, and one thing that, that um, uh, uh, William Shatlam said this, that was the epithet of our society, he said this, this civilization died because it didn't want to be bothered. I remember Francis Schaeffer saying about how, you know, we just like to live in our personal peace and affluence. You know, the, the idea that we, you know, as long as we can get along, get in our homes, shut our doors, um, if we don't see it, we don't have to think about it. Amen? If we don't see it, we don't have to care. If somebody's trying to paint this picture, but I don't want to hear the picture, I can just shut it off. I can tune it out. But here in the book of Nehemiah, if you, if you have your Bibles, um, you turn to Nehemiah chapter 1, we really see an example of somebody that did care. I'll try to paraphrase some of this because uh, of the time that we have. But, you know, we were talking about Ezra. We were talking about, I'm sorry, Zerubbabel. We were talking about Joshua early on, about how the people had come from this time period of Babylon. And the king had made a declaration that they could go back and build the temple of God. And they did that coming back with Zerubbabel. And, and it was a time period where, where uh, we kind of worked through some of the difficulties that the people had in building that temple. But here some years later, Ezra returned and then Nehemiah came. But Nehemiah asked this question. You know, if you look at chapter 1, um, verse one, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, came to pass in the month of Cheslev in the 20th year, as I was in Susan, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burnt with fire. Now, here we see Jer uh, Nehemiah asking a question. He, he shows that he cares by simply asking this question. You know, sometimes we, we look and, and, and some people prefer not to know what's going on. Because when we have information, it gives us obligation. Amen? And so when we truly care about people, we want to know what the facts are, no matter how painful those facts might be. The facts don't cease to exist because we ignore those facts. I've had relatives, you know, that um, didn't want to go to the doctor. And the reason they didn't want to go to the doctor was because they might find out something about what's going on in them. Do you have any people like that? You know, I don't want to go to the doctor because he might tell me I've got something wrong. It's like, you know, if you've got symptoms that something's wrong, wouldn't you know, like to know what it is so you can treat it? But it seems like, you know, we're, we're, we're like that. And uh, I, I, I'm dating myself now, but how many of you remember Hogan's Heroes? And you remember Schultz, right? And every time they were pulling something in front of Schultz, and he would turn his head and he'd say, I see nothing. I know nothing. You, you know, and, and somehow, you know, for us, we live in this society, and we want to put our blanket over our head because we really don't want to change things. Many people live their entire life trying to escape reality. There are many ways in which they do this. Maybe they drink alcohol. Others maybe shoot up drugs. 
Some get involved in affairs or they have wrong relationships. All of them in some way are trying to mask the reality of what's going on in their life. And for Nehemiah, he's turning out to be, this is a turning point in his life because he's asking a question about how his brothers are doing in Jerusalem. How they, you know, those that left years ago, they, they, they were rebuilding that temple. How are those doing? How, how are they doing, those that went over there? And they, you know, the ones that were captive before, but they came back to do the rebuilding. You know, and, and, and many commentators are kind of wondering about what's really happened in this guy's heart because, you know, God was doing something new, it seems, in, in Nehemiah's heart. Because if you think about it, those gates were burnt and the walls were down for hundreds of years already. Uh, not hundreds, but, but, but over uh, 70 years. They had been defeated in, in Babylon, and, and, and they had taken them over, and only the temple had been rebuilt. So when they're telling him that, gee, the gates are burnt and the walls are down, this wasn't new information. But somehow, this information touched his heart like it never touched him before. It, it was like a, a big door that just had opened. Uh, you know, a lot of times there are great life-changing events that can happen, and big doors swing open on little hinges. Moses went out to care for the sheep one day. But on that day, he saw a burning bush. And he heard the call of God. And life was different from Moses from that point on. David, you know, went, it was an ordinary day of taking care of the sheep. And, and while he's taking care of the sheep, all of a sudden, there's a prophet that calls him. So that he might anoint him. Then you got Peter, and James, and Andrew, and John. They're mending nets after a night of trying to fish that they caught nothing. But that's the day that Jesus called them to be fishers of men. There are days like this. You, you, you know, you never know what God has in store. There, there might be a very commonplace conversation that you're having with a friend or a relative. And, and so we, we need to keep in our heart the providential leaning of the Lord of what he wants to do. This question, this care, begin to affect the entire life of Nehemiah. You see in verse 4 that he not only cared enough to ask, but he cared enough to weep. You, you ask yourself the question, what makes people laugh? What makes people weep? Because uh, oftentimes this is an indicator of character. You, know, you see somebody trip, fall, and bang their face on the floor, and you laugh. Well, it says something about you, right? Or, or rather than trying to help pick them up. And, and when you laugh at somebody else's mistakes, you laugh at somebody else's misfortune, or, or, or you weep over some trivial personal disappointment, you're either lacking in culture or you're lacking in character. Maybe you're lacking in both. Well, sometimes maybe weeping is a sign of a weakness, but here we see Nehemiah weeping, and it's really a sign of strength. We read the, the prophet Jeremiah, who, who some have determined, determined him as being a weeping prophet. You see Paul, who wept over his people, his countrymen, even to the point of saying, if I could give up my own salvation so that they would turn. How about Jesus coming into Jerusalem? And he knows that the people have not recognized this as the day of visitation. And he wept over them. Because he understood the destruction. Because they didn't see the day of visitation, there would be a great destruction that would take place in their lives. You know, you have to ask yourself the question, when you find out the reality of things, can you cry? In Psalm 42 it says, my tears are my meat. In Psalm 126, it says, we sow in tears. There, there needs to be something that when you find out what's going on, that it would change the emotion of who you are. If you see somebody that's hurting and it doesn't affect you emotionally, you're, you're not caring. I know, you know, maybe we think that leading includes you know, uh, or 
how can we ever be sad because that's kind of culture to, to, to what we want to do because we want to always cheer somebody up. And that's true. We, we want to encourage somebody. We want to do that, you know. But, but you got to think of, of the fact that there are times and seasons if, if someone just lost a loved one and you come alongside of them and say, well, you know they're going to be in heaven. It's okay. We can get on with life now. Well, well part of your words are true. But, but you don't care. You can come alongside that person who, who, who maybe for 40 years lived alongside a spouse. And, and life is not going to be the same for them. Amen? And, and so we got to come alongside, the Bible says, to rejoice with those who rejoice, but also weep with those who weep. weep. You know, we, we come alongside him. And, and here, Nehemiah is understanding something, that, that he was like the Lord Jesus and that he willingly shared the burden that was crushing other people. When you can begin to understand the burden that's crushing somebody, when, when you begin to look at somebody, instead of saying that, well, they're taking drugs, they deserve what they've got, instead of looking at that, you try to understand what caused them to be in that, that predicament that they're in and then recognize that the sin is something that's taken the life out of them and you begin to be concerned about that you begin to weep over what's taking place in that person's life the destruction of the enemy and you can begin to pray and see something change why because you entered into that person's situation yeah. psalm 69 9 says because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me I wonder if we really cared to ask the question in our community. If we really wanted to understand the reality of things. If we allowed what is going on to begin to affect us emotionally. You know, it says here that in Romans 15, 3, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. In other words, when somebody mocks God, you know, the, the reproach of whatever's going on in their life is something that it, it affects us so deeply to say that how could they mock God? How could they not know the truth of who God is? How do they not know God is a loving Father? You know, all of a sudden you begin to carry that burden. And when God puts a burden on your heart, you, you should not try to escape that burden. I believe this, if you try to escape the burden, what you're going to do is miss the blessing that God has planned for you. Because when you come alongside, you, know, you realize that the tears are your seeds of providence that God has planted on your path. Without these seeds, it won't produce fruit. God wants to do something. He's trying to change our hearts. You know, we cannot be people that are just indifferent. We, we've got to begin to understand. Nehemiah was somebody that cared to inquire about the situation. There are people, we, we have so many people in our church right now that are down and out. You know, they're, 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 I shouldn't say they're out, they're down. They, you know, they, they've had, uh, you know, Dawn's dealing with a, a sickness right now with her heart. We need to pray and lift her up, amen, and, and begin to pray that God would fully restore her. But, but in, in the meantime, she, she has to walk out this walk of faith. We got our, our friend Bobby Andrade who, 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 you know, had these broken ribs and, and, and he's got his arm in the cast and, and some big contraption, you know, trying to wait until the time of healing, but he's not able to be with us, but do we care? Uh, you know, thank you for those of you that are, that, that, that are willing to make food and do those kind of things. And, and I'll just say, uh, as a commercial, see my sister Terry. She's coordinating all of those things so that we can make sure things get out there. I know Jimmy went out yesterday and spent some time with him. You know, there, there, are, there are these situations that are taking place. Helen Vizina, her, her, her husband Ron, you know, came off a truck, fell down, broke, shattered both heels. He's home. You know, thank God that we have care. We, we have all of these taking place. But in, in the midst of all of that, it's not just those that are broken. It's the caregivers also. Amen? We're coming alongside. We have, we have elderly people who can't maybe uh, come to church during the, the winter season. But you know what? The, we still love them. Amen? 
But there are people in our families, there's all around us that are people that are, that are struggling through some things. And the question is this, do we care? Even to ask them. You walk down the street and you see somebody that you haven't seen in a long time. And say, how you doing? You say, good, and you keep walking. How many of us do that? Did we want an answer? Or were we just being polite? Because the reality is we don't really want to know because if we know, we have to do something about what we know. Amen? Nehemiah asked the question, but that question burned in his heart to the place where he began to weep over the condition. He recognized that it was his people that he was weeping over. It brought him to a third phase and something that we've been talking about. You see even our hallway here is a big sign um, talking about prayer. It's, uh, it's in Portuguese, so most of you don't understand that. Um, probably somebody holding a Bible with a hand up like this, you could understand. They're praying. So pictures are worth a thousand words. Amen? But really the idea is this, that the Lord is really put in our hearts that we're not going to affect our culture unless we be people of prayer. Nehemiah begins to pray. It's a beautiful prayer in verse 5 to 10. If you look at the construction of this prayer, the first thing he begins to do in verse 5 is he acknowledges God's nature. He's saying, you're a great and an awesome God. Yeah, it's good to camp there for a little bit when we're praying, isn't it? We always begin our prayer acknowledging who God is. What? who he is, that, that he is good. Even Jesus, when he instructed his disciples to pray, said, you pray this way, our Father was in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, your, your name is above every name. Your name is, uh, you know, you speak your name and, and things move. Amen. We acknowledge who he is. He's great, is awesome. And then he, he says in verse 6 and verse 11, he professes and submits to God's sovereignty in light of which he's a servant. You know, you are great God. I'm a servant. Amen? I'm submitting unto your rule. It's like speaking the same thing. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, if you're king, and I'm a servant, and your kingdom's got to come, then I'm your servant here on the earth as well as in heaven. Amen? And he refers to God in verse 5 as you who keep covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. In other words, when he's speaking about God, he's saying, God, you're a covenanting God. And wherever you've made a promise, you keep your promises. You know, the words of Scripture are true. Wherever God's given a promise, he's going to see to it that he keeps his promise. I thank God that he keeps his promises even when we fail to keep ours. Amen? Amen. But he's recognizing this. He says, God, you, you're above. You're a great and awesome God. God, you are sovereign. In other words, you, you're the one that rules the affairs of men. And God, you're the one who keeps your mercy and your covenant. And then he begins to intercede for the people in verse 6. And he confesses the sins of the people, but he joins himself in that responsibility. You see that? He's saying here that please be attentive and your ear, eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. He's saying here, look, you know, just like that scripture that we first read in, in, in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, when we begin to acknowledge that it's our sin that's affected our nation. I'm part of that. You're part of that. Amen? We're all part of that. He, he's saying here that God, as I'm interceding, Lord, first forgive us of our sin. And then he's asking God, remember your covenantal promise. Remember this national restoration. Remember, God, that, that, that you have called us to be a people. And, and you have promised that you would take, if, if we got scattered because of disobedience to the north, south, east, and the west, you promised that you would gather a remnant people from every direction and bring us back together if we would turn to you. And this prayer is a prayer of 12 prayers that he prays in the book of Nehemiah alone.
It's obviously that this is man, Nehemiah was a man of faith, who depended wholly on the Lord to help him accomplish the work that he called him to do. Most of us would look at Nehemiah and say, man, was this guy a man of work? Because you see all the work that he did. But we understand now that what undergirded the work was his prayer. Nehemiah succeeded because he depended on the Lord. All of his actions came out of a heart that was able to feel the pain of people around him. There's a, Alan Redpath said this, and I think it speaks of much of the church's ministry in our day. There's too much working before men and too little waiting before God. I, I posted this week uh, an article that I read about, to, about the show. It's an interesting article from Leadership Today, but it was speaking about these pastors and this particular pastor who was on the West Coast and, um, you know, had taken part in the, uh, many of the pastors in the 80s had recognized that uh, they, we are a nation of consumerism and they began to design churches to be able to tap into the idea that people are people of consumerism. And so in other words, the church service was designed so that you could buy and choose and do all of this work. And, and, and this particular church grew to be a very good-sized church. And, and the reality was they had a big campus, big church, a lot of people, all of these things. And the pastor over time was trying to recognize and say there's something missing. There's something missing in what we're doing. You know, there was the, the musicians were professional. They were hired. You know, the, the, the service had to be within a certain amount of time. You know, and, and, and it gave to the place where the Lord was ministering to him. He knew something was wrong, and then he had a heart attack. And then for a period of time, um, he took, as he worked on a, a sabbatical, as he was trying to be restored, he was spending time with the Lord and, and working through this. And, and, and over time, I began to meet with his elders and said, you know, there's some things that we've missed along the way. Like, like while, while we have a, a great presentation, we lack the power and presence of God in our service. And they took some bold steps, and they recognized that, you know, apart from the power and presence of God in our service, um, we're not really people of God. They, they even came to the place of um, not hiring the professionals anymore, and get this, they got volunteers from the church to be their music leaders. But then they started getting complaints from the people that it wasn't professional like before. And, and the church actually went and over some period of time dropped less than half in number than what it was because people begin to leave the church because it wasn't any longer the show. Because what we're trying to say is it's not the show that's important. It's the one whom we're pointing to that's important. Amen. And, and so as this church was trying to become more authentic in the things of God, people began to leave, their friends began to leave, they began to leave. You know, they went through this thing, he says, I never realized the pain that we would have to go through as a church to simply be authentic again in our community. You know, sometimes I, I know we may not be a big church, but there are some things that are authentic here. Uh, we don't pay our musicians. Yes. Amen. And the thing is that we're, we're coming here, and, and I don't know about you, but I want to be able to meet with a Lord who would show us show up on a Sunday morning. Amen. Even if it means if we have to change our schedule a little bit. Right. Amen? Amen? Even if it means that so, somehow we, we have to change things up a little bit, that we can be open to the things of God. You, you know, that, that there is something here that we've got to recognize that says in Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Too often we plan our projects and then we ask God to bless our projects. Nehemiah did not make this mistake. He sat down and wept after he found out the condition of things. He knelt down and prayed. And then we read that he stood up and walked. And he began to do the work that God gave him to do. He, he cared enough that not only did he ask and weep and pray, but then he volunteered. 
You know, it's well saying that, that if prayer is not getting man, God's, I'm sorry, um, prayer is not getting man's will done in heaven, but it's getting God's will done on earth. But if God's will to be done on earth, he needs people available to do his work. Amen? Amen? And so God does exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. In Ephesians 3.20, we recognize God can do something great in us. But if God's going to answer prayer, he needs to start by working on the people who begin to pray. That's why we say, yes, the field is white under harvest, but what do we pray for? Pray for laborers willing to go into the field. God works in us, and he works through us to help us see our prayers answered. Because while, while Nehemiah is praying, his burden for Jerusalem becomes greater. His vision of what needs to be done becomes clearer. And, and, and this real prayer keeps your heart and your head in balance, so, so your burden doesn't make you impatient to run ahead of what God wants to do. But as we pray, God tells us what to do. He tells us when to do it. He tells us how to do it. And it's all important to accomplish the will of God. That he would want to do something. And so Nehemiah volunteers to go to Jerusalem to, su to supervise the building of the walls. It's interesting. He did not pray God send somebody else. And he didn't even argue the fact that he was ill-equipped to do the job. He simply said this, here I am, send me. See, I have much more to go today, but I'm going to stop right about here. Uh, I want us to understand something. When we're calling the church to prayer, when, when I just ask you to do some futile exercise, we're not trying to get you to be pietistic. What we're trying to say is, God, change our hearts so that we can begin to care for the people around us. And, and as we care for the people around us, in our prayer, Lord, change us so that we can hear your voice and do the work you've given us to do. There's a great work. There's a great harvest. There's a great people all around us. There, there are family and friends all around us that, that we can touch, that we can reach. If we'll only ask the question and want to get an answer. Maybe before you leave here today, ask somebody how they are. But really ask them how they are. Don't ask them how they are as they pass you. Take the time to find out how they are. And then you could pray for them, amen? Then you can carry some of the weight that they're carrying. Why? Because when we carry each other's burdens, it helps to make it lighter, doesn't it? It might not change your situation, but knowing that somebody cares makes a whole lot of difference, doesn't it? And then, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, we can ask of the Father. He can give us an answer to that prayer. How many secret things are we holding on to? How many things are we burdened by, but we've never shared with anyone to come alongside of us, to pray with us, to be accountable with us? Amen? Nehemiah had an ease of the palace. He had a good life. He was well taken care of. He left where he was to enter a place where people were beaten, People were discouraged. People were in toil. And he left that place to do something that most people would say was an impossible task. But with God's help, he did it. He saw something accomplished. In fact, we read in the scriptures, in 52 days, the walls around Jerusalem were rebuilt. The gates were restored. The people were rejoicing. But it all started with somebody that cared. You remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham, caring enough that we see Lot rescued from Sodom and Gomorrah. You, you know the story of the Israelites. And because Moses cared enough, God was able to deliver them out of Egypt. David was someone that the Lord used and he brought back a whole nation back to the Lord. 
Esther risked her life to save her nation from a time of genocide. Paul took the gospel to the entire Roman Empire. Jesus cared enough that he died upon that cross for an entire world. God's still looking for people who care. People like Nehemiah. People who will ask the facts. People who will weep over the needs. People who will pray for God's help. And then, people who will volunteer to see the work of God done. Here I am, Lord. Send me. That's what Isaiah said when he had that vision of God's holiness and he recognized that he was nothing compared to God. He said, I live among people who have unclean lips. I'm a person of unclean lips. God didn't use that as something to hold him back. An angel took a coal from the altar, came and touched his lips and said, what I have cleansed is cleansed. God has cleansed you. If you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, he's come with that coal from the altar and he's cleansed your life. And now you can answer the question, here I am, Lord, send me. Father, we come before you today. Lord, you've given us more than we could ever expect. You've given us great life, a life that's more abundant life, Lord. We do live in this world with tribulation and pain and suffering and things going on all around us. But you've called your people to care, to weep, to pray, to volunteer. Lord, I pray as we continue from this point, continue to strengthen us, Lord, so that we will enter into the work you've given us to do. Be the church like the church was in the book of Acts that was interceding for Peter. But even more so, Lord, give us a greater expectation that our prayers will do effective work. Thank you, Lord. We ask you today, let your presence be real in our lives. If we've come here today burdened, let us not leave here without sharing that burden with someone where we might be able to receive prayer. Lord, we thank you that you've given us a body of people to identify with. That as we come together, your great glory might be revealed to the nations of this world. And we thank you now. We glorify you. Be with our brothers and sisters who are hurting or in need of healing today. Touch their lives. Strengthen them, Lord. If there's someone here that needs a job, or they need a blessing, open the door, Lord, for their lives. Father, someone here just needs to know that they're loved. Move through someone today and show your love to them. We glorify you and thank you that you are sovereign in our lives. We can trust you. And Lord, that there is great hope for our land if we will trust you. We pray for our nation, Lord. Help us as a people of God to be righteous before you. We lift up those in authority and ask you, Lord, touch their lives today. May they know that there's a God in heaven that is supreme over all. We thank you for your care. We thank you for your steadfast love. We thank you for your covenant that you've given to us. Let your tender mercy continue to lead us day by day. 
pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.